percent for the last. And that's where we were when the war ended in Mooseburg, and uh, we were there when uh, Patton's men came down from Regensburg and freed our camp the last day of uh, April, and that and then the Germans surrendered on the eighth of May. I'm Steph Strickland with EAA Spirit of Aviation Week as part of the broader EAA Together initiative. Let's bring right now Kyle Franklin into the conversation. Kyle, the esteemed air show performer with this legacy of air show performing and showmanship in your family background. How are you today? Doing very well. Doing very well. Happy to be here. Well, I, I really appreciate you making the time. And I wanted to have an opportunity to talk to you about lots of things, but I want to start with the thing that people most know you for, uh, your air show flying. For folks who aren't familiar with the Franklin Demon 1 biplane, give me some of the specs on this absolute beast. This was nine years in the making for you to get yeah. this fine-tuned the way you wanted it? Yeah, nine to ten years uh, for Dracula. Dracula was something... Uh... My father and I kind of came up with it. The idea was to have an airplane that had that look, sound, and appeal, the old barnstorming airplanes in the 1930s, but yet some of the handling and performance characteristics of a modern-day Pitts or monoplane. And so it was, the idea was to take the Waco Mystery Ship, essentially, and shrink it down 20%, but still have you know the same engine on it, uh, more modern ailerons and everything, and make it a better performer. And it was something my father and I started, and then it just... And then after he passed, you know, I was still trying to get it going and everything, but need to say lots of glitches along the line and all different stuff. Anyways, we finally got it finished in 2012. And uh, it was uh, November, right before the convention was the first time I, the ICAST convention was the first time I test flew it and got it ready. Cause I was not, I was bringing the airplane to the air show convention in Vegas. And it's like, I was not going to take it out there without having it all having test flown it and uh but it was a, it's an amazing airplane in a lot of ways it's got uh the world's first direct port fuel injection system on the engine with uh developed by airflow performance and tulsa aircraft engines this is the only 985 out there right now that has this direct port fuel injection system on it along with a few other mods we made on the engine uh it went from 450 horse up to about 515 horse now it's a lot more responsive. The engine just performs a million times better on there. It's got a roll rate of, you know, almost 300 degrees per second, which is pretty good for as big as the airplane is. Uh, you know, most monoplanes and stuff, they're over 400 degrees per second. But going from the Waco Mystery Ship, which was about 90 degrees per second, to an airplane that's 300 degrees per second is pretty impre was pretty impressive and we're really happy with. But we did a lot of things to this airplane and building it that were – some of my own designs, uh, other friends' designs. Some of them worked, some of them didn't, and we had to go back and change things. But that was the neat thing about building a one-off airplane that's a one-of-a-kind, built from scratch, is we can try a lot of new ideas. If they don't work, we can change them. But some of the new things uh, worked out really well, including this injection system. And uh, it's, a, it's a fun airplane to fly. It absolutely looks like it. I have to ask you, though, as you were going through this this build and design and test process, what was one of the biggest challenges? You, you touched on it. You said some things just didn't work. What was the thing that just gave you grief that you finally managed to work past? Getting the thing built, honestly. just Because <laughs> I, I had a lot of friends. Now, I was building a lot of it, but I had a lot of friends helping me with this from uh, Steve Wolf. Uh, Steve Wolf had a big hand in it in the beginning. Uh, Mike Wiskus, another air show performer, he's the one that kind of helped me finally get it finished in the end. Uh, Kevin Kimball, all, all these different guys all had a hand in helping build this airplane. And if there was something I wasn't good at or I didn't know enough about, I would find the best out there to go and help me with this. But uh, that was one of the big things that was the biggest problem is just getting the thing finished. But uh, but when it comes to new stuff like uh where I placed the oil cooler on the airplane to, to, to try to keep the drag down as little as possible, less parasite drag. That was one that it worked, but the airplane wasn't cooling as well as it should. So we had to make some modifications to that change that up. Um, actually, um, another one was the alternator system on it. The alternator system for those engines is normally a 12 pound massive alternator that goes on the top of the engine. And it's an absolute nightmare to deal with. 
But uh, B and C specialty products, uh, they had sponsored a couple other things on my Super Cub from a comedy act, and they had a lot of unique small uh, alternators. And I asked them, like, hey, would you be willing to build one for this airplane? And it took, I had to twist their arm a little bit to get it done, but uh, we did get the, the alternator, uh, new alternator built and put on the airplane. It works great. And now they're actually producing those for other radial engines, uh, experimental radial engines uh, out there. So it was something new that, you know, between BNC and myself, we were able to come up with thing and we got something new on there. So there's a, there's a lot of unique things on the airplane, but there's a lot of the modern you know, like the, the aileron system is very similar to that of a pit special. And but for that airplane, it's working really well compared to the old barn door technology with uh, piano hinges on the ailerons and everything like the Waco was and everything that made a big difference. Given EAA's um, sort of grassroots love of building airplanes and being a part of the, you know, experimental aircraft world, do people just talk your ear off when you get there? Because this is like <laughs> building at a huge level. Yeah, well, you know, and that's that's something that I was really happy when we finally got it uh, finished and especially when I brought it to, to Oshkosh was that, you know, that's what EAA was originally all about was experimental aircraft. I mean, and, and building your own and everything. And in today's world, uh, there's not as much people still build a lot of airplanes, but they're built off of kits and everything like that. And being that this was a one off airplane that we took design characteristics of multiple different airplanes and found like, okay, this looks cool. This would make it perform better. This and this, I mean, the main three we used on Dracula was, uh, you know, the G GBR, uh, the GBR one racer, uh, bringing the cockpit all the way back and having it so far back and having more of that racing style. And then of course the pits with, uh, more of the controls and the ailerons, and then, of course, the styling of the classic Waco UPF-7 biplane. And, you know, that was taking all the different things and building it into one, uh, building an airplane from scratch. You know, that you don't see that as much as you used to anymore. So that was really cool to go, you know, to bring it up to EAA and show off this thing that uh, we had, me and a bunch of friends had built over almost 10 years. So it was really, it was uh Real cool to have that at EAA, and yeah, we had a lot, lot of people wanting to come by and look at it. And the the, the thing that I found that was a glitch behind it is people don't realize how much smaller it is to the Waco. You know, they look at it. I had a lot of people thinking, "Oh, you just rebuilt the Waco, and that's what it is. it's like." No, this is a completely new airplane, and it's twenty percent smaller. The low, the top wings. You know, if you look at a Waco UPF seven, the top wing is longer than the bottom wing, and uh, on Dracula the top wing is the same length as the bottom wing of the Waco. So it's that it's like four feet, it's four, four to five feet shorter on the wings than the Waco is. And people don't realize how, how much smaller it is to, to what the mystery ship was. And unless you get them side by side, which open here in another couple of years, I'll have that. <laughs> oh, I like your style. That's a little teaser for what maybe it's to yeah, come. Well, Very good. We're steadily, you know, a lot of people keep asking how the mystery ship's going, but it's just like anything else in life. You know, it's time and money. You never have enough of each. But the walk <laughs> is coming along. The airframe, all the airframe stuff has been repaired. The, we've got new wings that are built for it, and the new wings on it turned out amazing. Had a guy uh, up north in uh, Minnesota build the wings for it. And the wings, each wing, wing ended up stronger than the old wings and about 10 pounds lighter. And so it will we're real excited to have the wings finished and hopefully like I said next couple of years we'll have the mystery ship back up and running and see what we want to do with it. You mentioned something earlier when you were talking about the convention and you were referencing the International Council of Air Shows, which is a convention that happens in Las Vegas where all of us get together and basically have a family reunion, a lot of educational seminars, and a trade show floor. It's an awesome event, but you touched on something that I want people to understand about how you perform and fly. You build your airplane on site everywhere you go, and you take it apart, and you put it in a rig, and you drive it to the next location. Tell, tell me about this process, um, why you choose to do it that way. I mean, I know, but I'd like to bring people sort of behind the right. scenes. And, and what your air show experience is like, given that you have to put this plane together every single time you show up somewhere. Right. That was actually, uh, my father started that back around 1988 is, uh, you know, my father had done, my father and I, my father started doing air shows in 1967 was his first year doing air shows. 
And he flew airplanes around, you know, cross country and everything for over 20 years and got all he could stand of fighting weather. And, you know, you ask most air show performers today, they'll tell you the same thing is we come closer to killing ourselves and having more problems in flying from show to show than we do actually flying the stunts at the air show. The cross country stuff and getting bad weather and, you know, possible engine failure while you're flying cross country, all the different things. Those are more dangerous than the air show flying in a lot of ways. So anyways, uh, come 1988, you know, my father had had all he could stand of fighting weather and everything. So he started trailer in the Waco mystery ship. And, you know, I started off in the beginning whenever they put it together. It was taking four hours to put the airplane together and to take it apart and then jump ahead years later. Once we started figuring out different tricks and modifying things, uh, my father and I could assemble the Waco or even the jet walk at that time in an hour flat and Dracula pretty much the same way in a lot of ways. But Dracula was designed specifically with the trailering idea in mind where the airplane only holds at max about 45 minutes worth of fuel. We kept the tanks on Dracula very small to where it's built as an air show airplane. And that's all it's meant to do is fly air shows. It's not meant to fly cross country or do anything like that. So it has very low, uh, very low fuel capacity on it to keep the weight down. But it's a uh, it's a benefit in some ways because now I don't have to fight weather anymore. I can carry all kinds of spare parts in the trailer. You know, I carry everything, including the kitchen sink in my rig, and uh, it keeps time down on the airplane. And every time we assemble or disassemble it, essentially, I get to do an inspection of the airplane. I get to look at all the key high stress points and everything and hopefully catch things before they come a major problem. So, you know, but it's like anything else. There's pros and cons to it. Uh, if the weather's great, you know, someone else will take off and they'll be, they'll be home and two hours flying home, but we, it'll take us an hour to two hours, depending on the situation to disassemble the airplane. And then we have twice as long of a drive because we have to drive back home. So that's a benefit, but I've also been to air shows where, I'm the only one that makes it in there because everybody else is fighting weather because they can't get into the show and come day of the show, you know, me and maybe one other person are the only people there because everybody else is still fighting to get in. So, but it's a real, it's a benefit to us. And, uh, I, I like the trailing part. Plus we get to see more of the, more of the country and stop and see, see things. And it just, in some ways it's easier, but you know, in some ways it's a pain in the butt. It's the main thing that, we don't like is at the end of a long air show weekend, you're tired and you're looking at that airplane like, man, we got to take this apart and put it in the box. But it's again, it's it only takes, you know, depending on who's with me and helping me, it'll take hour, two hours to assemble or disassemble Dracula. So it's it's a uh, it's pretty easy. But uh, and that's it's the way we like to do it. We're one of the other than the glider guys and some of the micro jets. We're the only like big airplane that really trucks around uh, around the country there. But, uh, you know, it's just. The trailering was something my father started, and I agreed with why he did it. And so, and of course, this way, you know, my wife can come with me, the dogs, the cats. We, we carry everybody with us. So it's a lot of fun. <laughs> you take the flying circus on the road, so to speak. And I, I love that. Much, I want to yeah. talk about your dad. Um, you, you've mentioned him here, you know, in a couple different ways. And there might be some folks who um, are watching this who aren't necessarily familiar with your family's legacy. Tell me about Jimmy. Um, and everything he accomplished in his very storied career and how you try to um, emulate what he did and what you do. Yeah, well, it's a, how much time you got here? I mean, it's a long history. <laughs> I'll just have a, I'll pull out my chair and have a seat. <laughs> there, it's, the floor is yours, sir. Yeah, well, well, of course, you know, my family history goes back over 50 years now. Again, my, uh, I'll give, try to give the shorter version here. You know, my, my family the flying in my family started with my grandfather. My grandfather was a self-taught pilot at 16. Uh, he uh, just always liked airplanes. And then that's where the Franklin family legacy with airplanes started with, with my grandfather, Zip Franklin. And, uh, you know, he, he always liked airplanes, self-taught pilot. He was actually a farmer and a ranch, rancher. The farm and the ranch were 30 miles apart. And he used an airplane like most people do, a pickup truck. He, he would use the airplane to fly back and forth. Uh, to haul supplies back and forth and everything. And that's how my father learned to fly, was sitting on his lap going back and forth from the farm to the ranch. And, um, you know, to hear my dad tell, you know, he started learning to fly whenever he was still in diapers. And uh, by the time my father was about eight years old, he pretty much knew how to fly. 
a couple of years later at age 12, you know, age 12 was the main pivoting point for my father, which, you know, people talk about destiny or, you know, different things you're supposed to do. Well, 12 years old was a pivoting point for my father. That year, he, uh, while home alone, he snuck out and soloed himself. And that's a whole other story in itself there. But he snuck out and soloed himself. And actually, you know, father wasn't really mad. Zip wasn't mad about it. It actually just gave him another job. And so when my father would get home from school, get off the school bus, they'd have the family PA-14 all loaded up. And my dad would jump on, jump in it and fly to the ranch. And they put a feed hopper in the back that would drop uh, grain cubes and stuff out of the airplane to feed the cattle. And that's actually how my father started building time. And granted, you know, this is out in eastern New Mexico, where all my uh, family's from. We're all from uh, southeastern New Mexico. And uh, he uh, that's how he started learning. Bill in time was flying back and forth there. And the only bad thing that came out of that is anytime any airplane would fly over our ranch, the cattle would start chasing the airplane. <laughs> that was the only downside of that. But anyways, my father sold himself when he was 12 years old. He went to his first air show and saw Harold Cryer and Charlie Hillard perform and made the decision right then that he wanted to be an air show pilot. And he came home and bought a couple of antique airplane magazines. And uh, the, he was thumbing through one of the magazines and the centerfold in the center of this airplane, antique airplane magazine was a 1940 Waco UPF-7. And he just thought that that was the coolest looking airplane he had ever seen. And decided right, the, you know, right then that he, that's the airplane he liked, and he ended up pulling it out and putting it on his wall. His mom eventually took it down and framed it and put it on the wall. And then jump ahead a few more years, uh, they, my my father and my grandfather went at a sh show in I forget where exactly, but it was it was in Western Texas, and they were there as spectators. And as they were leaving. Uh, they noticed this airplane in an open tea hanger and they walked over there and it was a 1940 Waka UPF-7. Turns out it's the exact same airplane my father had hanging on his wall, which is in number 2369 Quebec. And it was the same airplane he saw in that magazine when he was 12 years old, still had it hanging on his wall. They ended up buying it on the spot for $4,500. Uh, my father flew it home and the very next year at age 19 started doing air shows, air shows with it. And it was a stock Waka PF-7 with the 220 Continental on it. And after that, it just progressively, year by year, you know, more horsepower, started modifying it, uh, went from 220 Continental to the 330 Jake to the 450 Pratt. And then one of the other Wacos eventually had a 600, uh, 600 horse Pratt and Whitney on it. And anyways, that's kind of where it started was with that airplane. And the unique thing is that is the airplane that actually, with the end number and everything, that actually became the Jet Waco in 1999 that most people are really familiar with. And uh, it was also the airplane my father was in whenever he passed. So it was kind of an interesting history there of how, you know, destiny, how all that stuff aligned for him. So anyways, that's kind of the shorter version of my father. But over the, over the years, and especially with when I came along and growing up with him, my father was, he was a true showman. He really was. And he, he always tried to come up with something different and unique that people had never seen before. And he viewed the air show industry as an entertainment industry. It's not just flying and, you know, showing off airplanes. People, you know, people who like airplanes, like at Oshkosh, you know, you expect most, most of the people there, they're at Oshkosh because they like airplanes. But not all people that come to air shows cross country necessarily, they might kind of like it. They're going for some entertainment. So how do you make this entertainment to normal people that don't necessarily like airplanes. And one of his big, uh, one of the big things that he did in the early eighties uh, was the act called czar. And he flew a uh, Aerostar twin engine Aerostar and it eventually got all painted up black. And he, uh, after watching the movie star Wars, he knew that this was going to be a big thing. And he got to thinking like, how can I kind of, capitalize on this hysteria with star wars in the air show industry and bring some of that big screen stuff to the air show industry so he came up with this character called czar and it's a space age comic book type character you know black suit helmet and wrote this whole story that at the time the story kind of emulated things that were going on in the world that uh, that year with iran and atola and all these different things uh it kind of emulated those things where people could relate more with it 
And anyways, in the beginning, though, when he first debuted that act, and he debuted at Oshkosh in 83, I think it was 83 or 84, I can't remember which, but he debuted at Oshkosh, and nobody knew who it was. You know, he kept it very quiet, and nobody knew who was flying this airplane and who Czar was. And he tried to kind of keep it like that for a while. But, um, you know, when that act first came out, he got a lot of negative feedback on it. So just people were like, you know, in the industry, negative feedback in the industry. The public loved it, but the industry, they, it was too circus, too circus like in these things. But then it ended up being such a huge hit that it spawned a major change in the air show industry where you started getting a lot of other acts like that, the Avenger, uh, Swift Magic. And a lot of people kind of started jumping on a little bit more of this circus type, you know, and uh, kind of cosplay type of stuff, which, in all fairness, in the 80s became was a pretty big deal with lots of costumes and different things. You know, well, my point is that I learned a lot of my showmanship and stuff from growing up with that act. And I have pictures even of me standing next to dad with a prototype costume on. And he was using me as because he was gearing the act up to more towards kids. So and I was three, four at the time. And he's like, OK, what do you think of this? You like this? You like the helmet? And he's using me as his test test protege, so to say. And uh Anyways, and the act was an amazing act, uh, changed the industry in a lot of ways. And uh, we did that act up to until 91. And uh, unfortunately, 91, we lost the airplane along with my grandfather in a ferrying accident. But uh, then, of course, over the years, though, my father, he had over the years, my father did. Oh, shoot. Over what was it? Almost 20 different acts and like 30 different airplanes over the years, just different types of acts, different things. I think that's right. Uh, but, uh, you know, including Czar, the Dueling Wacos. Uh, then, of course, in 99, debuted the Jet Waco, which was still a 1940 Waco biplane with a radial engine on the nose of it, but with a J-85 jet engine bolted to the belly of it. And that, once again, that was another one of those things where lots of negativity in the beginning, like, that's not going to work. And it was a little eerie in the beginning on there because Les Shockley, who designed up the Shockwave yeah. jet trucks, is the one that helped my father, you know, bolt this engine on. You know, the airplane was pretty much already done, but Les was the jet engine expert and he understood how all that worked. And he's the one that did the entire installation of the jet engine. And my father would go around, and show people pictures of it, saying like, oh, this is what we're doing. And he had aeronautical engineers telling him that's not going to work. It's just going to flip it over on its back. Is it, you know, it's not going to work. And uh, he you know, was a little concerned about it and asked less about it. And Les is like, you just leave the engineering to me and you just worry about flying the dang thing. So, but uh, in the initial test flight, we test flew it here in Neosho, Missouri, where I still live today. We uh, test flew it here and it flew perfect right out of the box. And it was an amazing thing. And again, one of those things that completely changed the air show industry again. And I actually, you know, I started wing walking on that. I'd been wing walking since I was 17 on the mystery ship. And then when we got the jet and when we got the jet walk, go, I was like, well, I guess we got to do a wing act with that. And and honestly, in the beginning, when we first tried it out here, it wasn't that big of a deal. Granted, we didn't have an air show aerobatic box and we were flying low and everything. And I didn't notice that big of a difference. But when we went, went and did our debut show with the jet walk, go, he about killed me on that wing because the airplane with that jet engine, it never slows down. So I never had a time, time to relax. And it just really wore me out. And I'm like, all right, we got to change some things. But uh, anyways, we had the, the Jet Waco uh, through, the, through those years. And starting about when I was about 20, I uh, started doing my comedy act uh, in my Piper Super Cub. And that Super Cub is actually the airplane I learned to fly in when I was eight years old. And uh, I started doing my comedy act along with mainly the I was still mainly doing wing walking. But I started flying the comedy act and started flying the Waco mystery ship at some shows, you know, very, very limited. And then after my father passed and I decided, well, I guess if I'm going to stay in this, I need to keep going with some other things. And so I kept kept doing the comedy and uh, started really wanting to bring the Waco back out there more. And then that's when I came up with uh, Pirated Skies which is a pirate wing walking act. Initially it started off as a solo routine. And then the next year we morphed it to the wing walk and that became a really big sensation on the air show industry and kind of changing things up and so things that nobody ever seen before. And then during that time I was also working on trying to finish up Dracula. So, you know, we're, we're always doing something, but the main, main thing in my family legacy is we like themed acts and, uh, 
you know, I've been called the king of themed decks because about everything I do has a theme to it. And I like the theme stuff. It's a lot of fun. It brings more to the act again, where it's not just flying. It's more of a, uh, you know, it's more entertaining to everybody. Anytime I'm developing up an air show act, I'm always trying to figure out what will entertain Everyone from a three-year-old child all the way to an 80-year-old man. You know, what in that, what will entertain them all? And again, because I view the air show industry as the same way, is it's a entertainment business. It's not just flying, it's entertainment. So what can you do to entertain everybody? You know, something, you know, if they don't like airplanes, you know, they might like something, they might like another part of this, the story part of it, the music. I get more calls about my music and everybody wanting to know what my playlist is for my acts than, if, than almost anything else. But, I mean, it's between my father and everything, it's, you know, he's the one that's, my grandfather's the one that started the flying, and my father's the one that started the air show part of it, and, you know, my whole family's full of pilots, my uncle's uh, been a, he was an air show pilot for many years, he actually did his official solo, his official legal solo, at an air show when he was 16. He actually, he actually soloed when he was 11. My father was 12, my uncle was 11, and uh, so they, uh, you know, my uncle's official solo was at an air show they were performing at. And my uncle flew at Oshkosh as well, but uh, he finally wised up and got a real job. And in the early 80s, he got a job with Southwest Airlines and has been with them ever since. So, but my whole family, including my mom and my mom, my brother, everybody in my family knows how to fly in one form or fashion. <laughs> I think that is so awesome. And, and just listen to the stories about, you know, Zip teaching himself, your grandfather teaching himself and Jimmy sneaking out to take a solo and how early you got your start. It's very clear that it is, uh, it's definitely in your blood. One of the things, and, and your entertainment theme builds variety into the show. Um, and, and I definitely appreciate that having watched you fly uh, many years. I want to know um, from your perspective, one of the things you do that I think is really awesome is you also like the smaller shows where, you know, we're, we're here talking to, you know, the EAA Air Venture crowd, you know, 600 plus thousand gate entries over the course of the week. And it's those smaller shows in the smaller communities where everybody turns out. Tell me about your love of the smaller air show. The small, the small shows I've always been ever since I was, ever since I was a kid, I, this, the big shows are great. You get to see everything, but they're just so, there's so many people, there's so many different things going on there, which is good, but at the small shows, you get more one-on-one -on -one with people, you know, and especially when you're, when you're, when I go out and I perform and I land, you know, I get to interact with more, with more people one-on-one -on -one and it's just, the shows are a lot simpler in some ways. And it's just the small show. And that's where more, you get more of the rural area people too, that not necessarily like the Oshkosh crowd. Like again, like Oshkosh, the Oshkosh crowd, they all love airplanes. Otherwise they wouldn't be there. Uh, but when you're doing small town shows, these are people that maybe have flown in that once in their life, maybe haven't flown at all, maybe love airplanes, but they all they'll, it's an event that they'll all come out to. So you get to inspire new more, you know, new pilots, uh, children and everybody. You get to get more into, you know, rural America in the small, smaller areas and find those people that you might not necessarily that aren't going to make the trek to Oshkosh or different, you know, or a big type event. But um uh, the little shows have always been my favorite. I mean, I've got to, you know, being we're in the midst of all this COVID stuff, most of most of my season was destroyed, but I still have a few small rural shows that I'm going to be doing uh, later on this year and uh, really excited about those. But unfortunately, you know, a lot of the small shows are starting to go away. And, yeah. you know, I've been kind of a big advocate on that, just trying to save the small shows. But unfortunately, between in the name of safety and a lot of other things and the FAA and even ICAST and a lot of the things they're doing in the name of safety is killing small shows. Uh, they're making it just, it's getting too complicated for the shows to try to get and too expensive to where these small shows can't afford it and can't do them anymore. So unfortunately I'm seeing kind of a trend where most of the small shows are going away and it's only going to be the bigger shows, which um, very disappointed about. We're still hoping that that doesn't turn out that way, but hopefully, hopefully we can save the small shows because I, you know, they're they're the ones that you know, talk to anybody that goes to a, talk to anybody that goes to air shows and likes big shows or small shows. You'll normally hear that they 
like prefer the small shows better because they can get more up close. They can interact with the performers a little bit more. But, you know, shows like shows like Oshkosh, that's that's kind of a Oshkosh is kind of like a big show, but with the little show mentality in a lot of things, because people, you know, they can get to us. And Oshkosh is always kind of a little bit more laid back on where we can, people can and can't go on certain things. And man, uh, we park our airplanes right out in front. My airplanes normally back right up to the fence. And I sit over there and talk with anybody who wants to come over. And that's something, you know, Oshkosh does very well that some of the bigger shows, you know, they'll have the crowd line, but they have us staged and everything, you know, on the other side of the field and we never can interact with people. So it's definitely, uh, the small shows are definitely better for interaction, but you know, Oshkosh is king on that. <laughs> well, let me ask you, what does Oshkosh EAA Air Venture mean to you and your family? Well, Oshkosh is just, it's, <laughs> it's kind of like, I'm trying to think of a way to put that. Oshkosh, I've been going to Oshkosh ever since I was well born. I don't know what my first year officially was at Oshkosh, but I know I had to be three or four somewhere around there. And Oshkosh is just, it's always been, you know, that yearly, yearly trek up there that I look forward to. It's a lot of fun, get to see everybody. And so many of my friends in the air show business too, we don't all get to see each other. Sometimes, you know, the convention or Oshkosh are the only times we ever get to see each other because we're doing different shows all across the country. And some people we might see weekend to weekend, other time, others we might not see all year. So Oshkosh is always a fun one. It's kind of a, you know, it's, a, it's another convention, a reunion thing where a lot of us in the air show industry can all get together, you know, and talk, have a, have fun, of course, have all the parties at Oshkosh to do and, you know, watch each other fly. And, of course, a lot of uh, fans in the aviation world, they all come there, too. So I, I see a lot. I see a lot of friends. Some I've made in person, other ones you know, through Facebook and social media that I the only time I ever see them is at Oshkosh. So it's kind of like a giant family reunion for me, being that I've always been going to Oshkosh. And I have so many friends, whether they're airship performers or uh, fans or whatever there. Uh, my sponsors, of course, all there and get to see all these people every year. And it's just. I don't know. Oshkosh is just, it's like that yearly family reunion for me being my entire life has been in the airshow world uh, and aviation. I enjoy going to Oshkosh every year. It's a lot of, it's a lot of fun and it's kind of like that. It's a family reunion for me. <laughs> if you weren't an airshow performer, what would you do for a living? Oh, well, I guess that kind of depends, you know, 20 years ago, I don't know what I would have told you there, but right now actually, and again, it kind of relates to my air show world is ever since I was a kid, Halloween has always been my favorite holiday. I've always loved Halloween ever since I was a kid. It's just, I don't know why, but Halloween always enthralled me being able to dress up in a completely, you know, and be somebody else, be a different character. And Halloween, I've, I've just been obsessed with it my entire life. And that's actually where, you know, like Pirated Skies, Dracula, uh, Airplane, those those type of things, I kind of fed off my passion for Halloween is, you know, my two favorite things. Uh, I've got pictures of me as a kid, uh, as a pirate and as a vampire. Those were my two favorite things as a kid was pirates and vampires. And it's needless to say, you know, that's kind of where pirated skies came from. You know, I sit sitting at home watching TV and, and the, uh, you know, I had already done one year with the Waco and I'm like, you know, what can I do to spice up the Waco more and be something different and not just be another big biplane out there. And then pirates of the Caribbean came on TV and I'm like, huh, you know, it's already the Waco mystery ship, you know, and like I love pirate and I've always loved pirates and, you know, how great would that be? I get to dress up as a pirate every weekend. And so I, you know, that's where Pirated Skies came from. And again, Pirated Skies was one of those things, too, where it got a lot of negativity. Even, well, even Amanda, my late wife, uh, she wasn't really into the pirate thing. And most people weren't uh, that were close to me. But w once I even had one of my good friends in the air show industry, another performer, he even said when he first watched that, me and my get up, my pirate up, he's like, what is he thinking? It's just so, that's just dumb. And then he saw the reaction from all the kids and the crowd and how much they liked it. He's like, well, I guess he does. I guess he did come up with something there. So it's, but all of that stems off of my love of Halloween. And then of course, even Dracula pushing on for Dracula. 
So honestly, you know, back to your original question, what would I be doing otherwise? I would probably be doing something related in the haunt industry or something related to Halloween. It'd still be some form of entertainment. I, I like the entertainment business and I like I like entertainment, entertaining people. That's one reason, you know, I keep doing the air show thing like this because it's a, as I always say, it's a hard way to make an easy living doing air shows. It's, it's a lot of fun, but it's a lot of work too. And, you know, the flying is the easy part and the fun part, keeping the machines running, booking shows. Cause I am a hired, you know, I am a traveling circus and a hired act. I don't have a big sponsor like some others out there that pay my wages through these things. So I have to actually have to try to make money doing this. And, but the actual the reaction when I get done flying and then I land and people just say, you know, that's the craziest thing I've ever seen or I can't believe how, you know, how low you got in the flat bird spin and where they just all the different things and the music just when they when I get those reactions, as long as people continue to enjoy what I do and come out to watch me fly, I'll continue doing this because that's I mainly do this now for my fans and the people that come out and watch me fly. Uh, but, uh, you know, that's. That's the main reason I keep doing these air shows and doing what I do is because I like entertaining people and I like the reaction I get off of them and bringing joy to their bringing joy to them and seeing the smiles on their faces is why I continue to do air shows. And again, the reason one of the reasons why I do all the different theme stuff and try to because I want everybody to enjoy it, not just one person or another. I want everybody to enjoy it in one form or fashion. So. Yeah, if I was doing something else, I'd probably be doing something either in the, the haunt industry or something related to Halloween, or my other big passion is movies. Uh, movies, not so much performing in them, but I love drive-in movie theaters. I've actually, our local drive-in, I've been bugging the original owner for over oh, about six, seven years to sell me the thing, but uh, anyways, it ended up not happening, but you know, the movie theaters and nostalgia stuff and Halloween are my two main things, so I figure... If I ever get out of the air show industry or try to do something else, that's the direction I'm probably going to go. <laughs> I definitely think everything that you have brought to the industry has absolutely entertained people. And, you know, I appreciate just the legacy um, of your family's history and the fact that you have sort of carried on the, the mantra for the family. Kyle Franklin, thank you so much for making the time. I really appreciate it. Yeah, my pleasure. Happy to do it. Happy to do it. For everyone watching EAA Spirit of Aviation Week coverage as part of our broader EAA Together initiative, thanks for your time. My pleasure. Hope to see you all at Oshkosh next year. Bring the sights and sounds of Oshkosh to your home. Compiled from hundreds of hours of footage, the best of Oshkosh, Fighters, puts you front and center as meticulously restored warbirds share the sky with today's frontline combat jets. Use code SOAWDEALS and receive free shipping now through July 25th. Order yours today at eaa.org slash fighters. Spirit of Aviation Week continues with a very special presentation on Stream 1 at 7 o'clock. Join Major John Waters as he hosts a panel of Air Force demonstration pilots, including Major Joshua Gunderson, an F-22 demo pilot, Major Garrett Schmitz, F-16 Viper demo pilot, Major Cody Wilton, an A-10 demo pilot, and Captain Kristen Wolf, F-35 demo pilot. They'll talk about their experiences flying some of America's high-tech jets at air shows around the country. Spirit of Aviation Week continues through Saturday. Visit eiatogether.org for a complete schedule and a list of other activities. The Aerolite has been designed to meet the criteria of FER 103 